Great to have you back here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. And now let's go back in history, uh, of course, to share with you things that happened on this day many years ago. I'm going back to the year 2014. Um, many times, of course, we've shared about uh, where we're coming from security-wise and, you know, the peak of bomb blast, um, you know, and as a tactic uh, by the Boko Haram sect, you know, and it was on this day in the year 2014 that a suicide bomber blew himself up alongside seven others. Uh, of course, a while about 20 others sustained life-threatening injuries at the premises of the Kano School of Health Technology. Uh, scores, of course, were feared dead at the premises of the, um, of the school along the Gida Murtala Road. The high-caliber explosive device went off around 2 p.m. at the time the school was in session. It appeared to come from a parking lot next to the provost uh, office of the School of Hygiene. Uh, and, of course, victims were, uh, of the blast were new intakes of the school still undergoing screening. The Kano State Commission of Police back then, Ade Lenri Shinaba, revealed that eight vehicles packed within the premises of the institution were damaged. And the commissioner disclosed that a suspect was apprehended at the scene and ruled out a car bombing in its uh, latest attack by the insurgents. Um, it, of course, uh, at that time triggered uh, loads of, or uh, triggered pandemonium across Kano State and, um, you know, um, places around the um, explosion at that time. And of course, you know, once again, it was one of those times when uh, bombings were used as a tactic by the Boko Haram sect, you know, either suicide bombers or, or bombs in vehicles, mm -hmm. in parked vehicles and, and, the, and the likes. Um, you know, I've also repeatedly said it here that, you know, luckily we've moved away from that era where people used to be scared to go to church or to the mosque or to the supermarket uh, to, um, you know, to anywhere, you know, where there was a gathering of more than 10 people because you can never just tell what will happen. Um, um, you know, uh, on that day. So, um, back in history on this day it happened, and I remember a conversation with someone who uh, used to work in one of the big you know, supermarkets back then in Kano. Uh, sometime, a couple of years later when we, you know, we met again, uh, he was sharing stories with me of back then of how these bombs used to go off, you know, every, you know, like every week. Um, not very many of them were reported by the news, and it was almost a a weekly occurrence for him to be um, at work here, you know, a bomb explode and then see government agencies come, you know, to pack dead bodies and to clean up, you know, the mess and all of that. And it seemed like a daily occurrence. You know, you might be in the office and you hear a large explosion somewhere down the road uh, to tell you that another bomb has, you know, exploded. So um, the Nigerian government um, either has been able to defeat the Boko Haram on that you know, on that level where they can no longer make these IEDs, they can no longer, you know, pull together, you know, suicide bombers, they can no longer uh, use that tactic uh, to, uh, you know, affect Nigerians. Either that, or they simply have just changed strategy completely and have now, you know, turned into, you know, bandits and, and the likes. Just unfortunately, it's what occurred in this day in history. Yeah, really, really sad. You know, seven people um, dead, about 20 others sustained injuries. And these were people who had just resumed school. They were just undergoing screening, you know. It's, it's, it's terrible that we still have security challenges, even though in different dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. The next story takes us to Thailand, 2018, June the 23rd. And it all began with a birthday. So 12 students, so 12 young boys, and their assistant coach, these boys were aged from 11 to about, um, you know, a 16. Their coach was a 25-year-old, you know, man. So these 12 boys and their assistant coach, 13 of them, you know, they wanted to explore their city, right? They, it was the birthday of one of the boys, and usually they would, you know, take a stroll, explore the forest, explore that mountain area. It wasn't anything new. You know, so on that birthday, they decided to do just that. So they explored, they went too far in, and then there was flash floods, they wanted to take shelter, so they ran into a cave. But the sad thing is it's been raining for days, so there was this cave in, you know, it caved in and they were basically trapped inside. Just so they can get shelter, they crawled further deep into the cave, and they were not found until two weeks later. It was a very, very, you know, shocking situation it drew worldwide attention because lots of people were deployed to find them there were navy seals there were divers policemen sniffer dogs vigilante groups 
the village officials, the police. It was just a lot trying to save these men. The good thing was their 25-year-old coach, you know, um, understood meditation techniques. He had been a monk, so he was able to teach them how to, you know, breathe with limited air, how to just re remain calm. They had carried some water with them. So for two weeks, they were there without food. It was just a very, very sad situation. It, it drew worldwide attention, like I mentioned. People were praying for them. You know, all the deployments, you know, globally, just to make sure that those boys were found home. And eventually, they were rescued. Uh, two weeks later, they were taken to the hospital. They received treatment. You know, they got food and water and were reunited with their families. So they had sent Amoteko and they found them faster. But <laughs> oh sadly, God. they couldn't. That's about the thing. Oh you need to have a motekun, you know, in some of all these places, you know. But it, you know, um, besides the you know funny part, um, I think it also you know tells the importance of having uh, great disaster management uh, tactics. You and know, to see and, how much value was put on the, yeah, on the lives line. of those yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah you know, Not to say let's bombard the place; there'll be collateral damage. But well, we'll get um, some alive. Well, th 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 those are totally different scenarios. You know, I'm just you know e expressing. Um, first of all, the value of, hum of uh, human life, even if it's one person or two people, yes. um, the fact that the government will shut down entirely and ensure that all resor no resources are spared to ensure that those lives are saved. Um, and also, you know, being able to have the facilities to ensure that, you know, they are also rescued. Um, I hope that we can get there, you know, as a country and be able to value every single Nigerian life, regardless of where they go, or what they are, or what tribe they are from, um, and ensure that every life is saved. And that, that's, you know, message to them, actually. All right, stay with us. Uh, we're, of course, going into our first major conversation for today. Uh, we're going to be speaking about the sentencing of Farouk Lawan, who has been found guilty of uh, bribery of $500,000 in the year 2012, nine years after, has been sentenced to seven years imprisonment. And we're getting into that conversation right after the short break. <laughs> 